For 50 years, the Nobel Conference at Gustavus Adolphus College has hosted preeminent scientists, theologians, and ethicists to discuss deep questions in the intersection of science and society. From the newest results in physics, chemistry, and biology to the newest fields of multidisciplinary study, scientists at the Nobel Conference have examined the universe at its largest and smallest scales, explored the oceans, and described new materials. Conference speakers have debated the mechanisms of aging, as well as science and economics of food. Often, speakers have given us a glimpse of the next big questions and how they might be answered. Throughout all of the conversations, ethicists and theologians have grounded the science in a human dimension. The 50th Nobel Conference at Gustavus is celebrating a half century of bringing breakthrough science to lay audiences in the upper Midwest, across the country, and recently around the world. Nobel Conference 50 is assembling previous Nobel Conference participants to look at recent advances in future directions in the physical sciences, evolutionary biology and ecology, medicine and physiology, and the intersection of science and public policy. Patricia S. Churchland is the University of California President's Professor of Philosophy Emerita at the University of California, San Diego and holds an adjunct professorship at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. Dr. Churchland is noted for her contributions to neurophilosophy and the philosophy of the mind. We hope you enjoy this year's presentation by Patricia S. Churchland entitled, The Brains Behind Morality. here. Somehow this got way, 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 way. There we go. Well, the inimitable Josh Brown uh, has just given me the most amazing introduction I think I've ever had. <laughs> um, thank you. And um, yeah, it was really amazing. Um, and uh, let me just add to the comments of, of the other speakers how absolutely stupendous it has been to be here. Um, and, and how clever of you to arrange the weather to have just that right amount of fall Minnesota freshness. Um, it's absolutely been glorious. And I've learned a lot, and not just from uh, the speakers. Now, um, what I want to talk about today is a problem that has really bothered me for a very, very long time, and which only recently did I feel I sort of had at least a semi-grip on. And the problem is where our moral values come from. How is it that we care about others, that we're willing to cooperate? How is it that we're willing to incur a cost to ourselves in order to ensure a benefit for others? Where does that come from? Now, when we think about the brain in the context of evolution, or when we think about the nature of any animal in the context of evolution, of course, we're reminded of what Paul McLean used to say, which is that evolution selects those who can succeed at the four Fs, feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproduction. <laughs> And failing success at those, if you don't, for example, have the appropriate wiring for homeostasis that Dr. Damasio talked about, if you don't have the wiring to flee when there is danger or to seek food when you are hungry, uh, then you will be one of natural selection's casualties. And I think we all understand this very well. Self-neglect is not selected for. And so the question is, is sort of this then. It seems that we are all wired to take care of ourselves. And in that sense, we are very self-centered. And this has prompted many people to say, as Richard Dawkins did actually in The Selfish Gene, that morality and moral values have to be imposed from without because they cannot come from within. 
And this has always seemed to me to be a bit strange and kind of unworkable, especially because we see in the animal world, especially amongst birds and mammals, something that often approximates altruistic or at least uh, caring and cooperative behavior. And Darwin, of course, did not actually agree with Dawkins on this point. Darwin said that our moral sense, our conscience, that voice that says, no, don't, or yes, you must, derives from our social instincts, from our habits and skills acquired after birth, and from our capacity to solve problems. And I think he's probably right about that. What Darwin didn't know and what we understand much better now with the progress in neuroscience and molecular biology is that we can say something about those social instincts. And we can say quite a bit about what is the nature of learning habits uh, and skills. Now, before I move on to that, there are a couple of preliminary points that I want to make. And one is that in thinking about moral values, I like to place our kind, Homo sapiens, in the wider picture of other kinds of humans, as Svante Pabo, of course, did yesterday. And in this slide, you will see on the vertical axis uh, years in millions, and on the horizontal axis, you will see spatial extent. And you will see that, of course, there are a number of kinds of humans. And one of my favorites, of course, is Homo erectus, whoops, who lived for about 1.8 million years. And notice that they got themselves a long way uh, into Asia. And they seem to have done that by uh, lashing uh, logs together using vines, amongst other things. Homo erectus has a brain that is about 800 cc's. Yours is about 1,300 to 1,500. So they had rather smaller brains. They may have used fire. Homo neanderthalensis certainly did have fire. They had brains that were at least as large as ours. And for most of the history of Homo sapiens, us guys, uh, we seem to have been hunter-gatherers who lived in very small groups. We don't see the advent of organized religion until well after the development of agriculture, roughly 10,000 years ago. And so we see all of these varieties of humans living in groups and probably cooperating within the group, perhaps fighting with other groups and so forth. And they did not do it by virtue of organized religion. Just as some hunter-gatherer groups extant in the early part of the 20th century or even now don't have an organized religion that gives them rules, that gives them laws. And so that raises a very interesting question about social instincts that Darwin talked about, and about that reasoning or problem solving that plays a role. What is that? Where does it come from? How is it that given certain ecological conditions, certain kinds of social practices tend to emerge? The other preliminary point I want to make is that sociality is certainly not unique to birds and mammals that we see it in many species, it has almost certainly evolved uh, many times. Insects can be very social, fish can be very social. But we tend to think that there are rather significant differences in the sociality of birds and mammals, especially because we have very large brains relative to those of insects, and that gives us not just uh, an instinct to be social, but also a capacity for flexibility for the cognitive and the deliberative, and may I say the voluntary, uh, to enter into the picture. And so we see a much, much richer and more complex form of so sociality uh, in birds and mammals. So in birds and mammals, uh, 
there, I'm actually just going to show you the birds, and I'm going to let birds drop out of the picture, although uh, just because it's simpler given the limitations of time. Um, in birds and mammals, then, we see something really rather different from at least most of, um, gah, most of their um, uh, reptilian ancestors. Another preliminary point that I want to make is this. At some point, you're going to say, well, let, let's see if we can't be a little more precise about what we mean by sociality or what we mean by moral. And I think that's a perfectly appropriate comment at this stage. So the, the aside that I want to make here depends on some discoveries made um, in the early 60s by Eleanor Roche and subsequently developed by a lot of experimental uh, psychologists. And the basic point is one that many of you will already know, and that is that our everyday concepts, the ones that we use to get around with, talk to people with, and so forth, have a radial structure. And what that means is that at the center are the prototypical cases, the ones we all agree upon, the prototypical cases of a category. And the category's boundaries are very fuzzy. Well, we don't know what to say about uh, cases at the boundary. And in between, with declining similarity to those central prototypes, uh, are other cases. So let me give you the example. Suppose we're interested in the category of vegetable. And this is, is really a good instance of what Eleanor Roche was talking about. At least in the West, everyone agrees that a carrot is a vegetable. And so we think of that as the prototypical vegetable. It's in the center. Now, uh, in the little bit further out are radishes. Some people, no, nah, no, they're not really vegetables. I'd never eat them. We never eat them at home, whatever. Uh, they're not prototypical vegetables. And then further out yet again are wild mushrooms or, say, parsley. Uh, and you might be, these are chanterelles, you might find them in the grocery store, that doesn't thereby make them vegetables. They're sort of out there in the fuzzy boundary area. And mostly, for ordinary purposes, we don't care about the boundary cases. People do not get into heated bar fights about whether parsley really is a vegetable. Nobody really cares. And for normal purposes, this kind of vagueness is just fine. Often in science, where we want precision, then we get it. And sometimes this is also true uh, in the law. There is a very specific meaning to insane within the context of the law, for example. Now, the other point I want to make about this is not just that most of our workaday categories have this feature, but that there are cultural variations. So that in the far north, uh, an igloo may be a prototypical house, whereas a Winnebago not, uh, and so forth. And so there are going to be cultural variations as to what counts as a prototypical instance and what are in the boundaries. Now, this isn't, of course, just an idle comment about categories. I'm making this point because I think that social categories are similarly radially structured. That we learn what it is to be a friend, what it is to be honest, to be brave, to be kind, by learning the prototypical cases. Not the complicated cases, but the prototypes. But, of course, there are fuzzy boundaries for all of these. What it is to be brave, we agree on the prototypes, we don't often agree on uh, the fuzzy boundaries. I think this is also true of the category moral and the category not moral. And so, while I respect those philosophers who have spent their lives trying to get a precise definition of what it is to be moral, I think that it's probably uh, a misbegotten enterprise. So back then to uh, 
biology and sociality and that part of sociality that has to do with what we think of as moral behavior. And I should just say then that I tend also to see um, sociality as falling on a spectrum where there are very, very serious cases at one end and not so very serious cases at the other. Whether you lick your knife at table is probably down here. Uh, whether you neglect children is probably up here. And in between um, is everything else. And I don't think that there is a clear distinction between, as it were, conventional practices uh, and moral practices. The boundary is fuzzy, just like it's fuzzy with regard to when a man really becomes bald. I mean, is he got to have, you know, 700 hairs or two thousand? We don't really care. We can sort of roughly tell when the guy's bald. <laughs> so the claim is essentially the Darwinian claim. Sociability is a basic value for mammals. And natural selection has pulled that off. I haven't said how, but I will. The hub of the story depends on neurochemicals, and in particular, oxytocin, which is a very simple ancient peptide, which has a sibling peptide, vasopressin. And the two of them are really in the game together, but for simplicity, I just put up uh, oxytocin. And then there, are, there is learning. Learning in the context of the social group into which you are born. Learning through approval and disapproval, what is expected and what is appropriate. And so what I want to talk about now is that neurobiological platform that in a sense made it possible for humans and, to, and other mammals to acquire norms. Why do we care? So let's, I, this will be a very simplified version of uh, the evolutionary history, but I want to get several important points across, so I'm just really going to highlight them. So at some point, several hundred million years ago, some mammals must have acquired the capacity to be, to keep themselves warm regardless of temperature, to be warm-blooded. And there is a tremendous advantage, of course, that comes with that. And that is when everybody else has to go to sleep because the sun is down, you can forage. And these were probably small animals and they could forage safely at night. They might even be able to nibble a bit on those big guys who were sluggishly waiting for the sun to come up. The other advantage is that they were able to move into territory where it was too cold for the cold-blooded animals. A tremendous advantage. But there are costs. And one of the costs is that it's very expensive in terms of energy to keep yourself warm. So gram for gram, uh, a warm-blooded animal has to eat about 10 times as much, which means that a given patch can support many fewer foxes than it can voles or mice of a comparable size. So there's going to be a thinning out and a spreading out. One of the other things that happened in all of this was that perhaps as a result of being able to move into different environments at different stages of development, it became advantageous to really learn, to be born fairly immature, and then to tune yourself up to whatever environment you happen to find yourself in, and to tune yourself up quickly and elaborately and in a very complex way. Now, of course, if you're a turtle, you pop out of your egg, nobody's around, you try and scuttle down to the ocean the best you can, and you're fully ready to eat, and flee, fight, and not the other. Um, that comes later. Now, in the case of mammals, of course, they did have this great advantage. They were born very immature, and uh, the earliest, even the earliest mammals must have been born 
very immature, and they were able to tune themselves up to the environment. And somehow Mother Nature realized that it's much, much faster to allow a brain to tune itself up to the environment than to put into the genome everything that the critter's got to learn. So you can give it some basic biases and then turn it loose um, to learn. So fine, the mammalian infants are born immature, but that means they're born dependent. So Mother Nature, in her wisdom, I'm sorry to talk like this, but you know, um, Mother Nature would have had to, it would have had to have happened that there was a mutation or a cluster of mutations such that the wiring of the mammalian mother changed so that she cared for the offspring in the way that she cares for herself. So, um, I'll go back to that in a minute. So just as the mother rat sees to her own food and warmth and safety, so for the offspring, it's like an extension of herself. And that wiring had to take place in the brain of a mammal. Now I'm going to say, and this and Bert, um, I'm going to say a little bit more um, about the cortex because one of the things that's rather striking about mammals is that they have this structure called cortex. And in this slide, you can see the rhesus, well, the rat, the rhesus, the chimp, and, and us. We all have it, whereas the crocodile and the fish and the frog don't. The crocodile, well, let me show you what a mammalian cortex looks like. Many of you will know this, but it's always nice uh, to, be, to go over it again. All right. So what you're looking at on the left is a coronal, uh, a section this way. It's only that purple rind on the outside that is the cortex. And the white stuff underneath it uh, are fibers carrying signals from cortex to other areas. Now the amazing thing about the cortex, and this is a little tiny bit of cortex blown up, is that it has these highly organized, systematically layered structures. Roughly six layers, depending on how you count. And there are specific layers for input and specific layers for output, and it's not just kind of a random jumble in any sense at all. An alligator or a turtle does not have anything like that. It has what you might call a dorsal cortex, where there's kind of a loosey-goosey, maybe a two-layer structure. Nobody really understands the development in evolutionary terms of the cortex. How we got from having this loose dorsal cortex of an alligator uh, to this one, except that you do save on wiring by taking uh, a structure and putting it on top of the other. And saving on wiring is always good because wiring takes space, wiring takes energy. Um, but an equally important part of the story, as you will see when we talk about learning norms and social practices, are the subcortical structures shown here in color. Um, but in particular, what I want to highlight are the, the blue and uh, up at the top, uh, the caudate. There we go. There, uh, the caudate, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. And then down here um, is the hypothalamus. And it's there that oxytocin uh, has its, um, its venue. All right. So all vertebrates have oxytocin and vasopressin. So it's not that there is a wholly new chemical that we get with mammals. It's rather that something that was already there over evolutionary changes got transformed and put to a new job. And in particular, um, the job to which it was put uh, is the job I roughly outlined earlier, and that is it involves once there is 
an offspring, the mother is deeply attached to that offspring. It's like it's part of her. But similarly, when the baby is being held and cuddled, and this is true of mice and rats and wolves and the whole kit and caboodle, they too feel good. Oxytocin is released in their brain. They become very attached to the mother. And it's during this process of cuddling and nurturing and so forth that the attachment deepens and deepens. Now, you know all that. But what's interesting about it from the point of view of morality and sociality is that this is a wholly new kind of behavior. A mother frog lays her eggs and hops off. A mother turtle lays her eggs and hops off. And suddenly you have a wholly new behavior that involves caring for another at, if I may say so, considerable cost to yourself. And the longer the period of development, uh, the, the greater the cost, especially if they go to medical school. So the, the critical structures where the wiring changed, so you know the cortex is new, but the critical structures where the wiring changed and where oxytocin was released, and released in such a way as to kind of cement that attach, attachment, uh, was in, um, in the, in the uh, hypothalamus. A tiny little fingernail piece of structure way deep in the brain but it has the power to control so much. And it controls, amongst other things, uh, feelings of appetite, hunger, thirst, horniness, attachment, uh, and so forth. All right. So I think it is kind of a remarkable thing that we take for granted, of course, this paternal and maternal care for offspring. Uh, and yet, it is something that allows for the next step, which is small other genetic changes that then allow for this wider and wider group living, uh, this wider social behavior. And this brings me to the story of the voles. And I do apologize to those of you who already know the story of the voles, but it is my favorite story, so I have to tell it. So, there are many species of voles. They were discussed earlier today. Very tiny little animals they are. Actually, I guess it was, uh, it was concerning the kestrels. And uh, montane voles, living in the mountains, are more or less uh, what most people think of as a rodent's life. And the male and the female grow up. They come together. They meet. They mate. They go off on their merry way. He's looking for more action. She's going to have the babies. Prairie voles are completely different. So prairie voles get together, they meet, they mate, and now they're bonded for life. They stay together. He will guard the nest. He will chase away predators as well as other suitors. He, in, very interestingly and very unlike the montane male, will help to rear the pups. And um, in, their, in their other behavior, if, for example, you separate the two, they get very depressed. And I can tell you later what the measures are for that. They want to be together. They like to hang out. Now, as an aside, I have to acknowledge that um, this does not imply sexual exclusivity. Most of the sexual action and the reproduction does take place with the mated pair. But they all do have a bit of crumpet on the side, as the English say. Um, but nevertheless, it's a behavior that's very, very different. So when Sue Carter and Larry Young and some other people thought about this, they said, what's the difference in the brain? It must be a difference in the brain. So they looked. There were some false starts, but they soon came to a remarkable uh, understanding. So what you're looking at here are sections of brain from a montane vole and from a prairie vole, and they're, they're marked up top. Oops. Now, OTR means oxytocin receptor, so that's uh, shown here. 
uh, vasopressin receptor is here. So what you see, now these gray areas are stains for the oxytocin receptor. And what you see in the prairie vole brain in one very specific area, central thing in the reward system, the nucleus accumbens, high density of receptors for oxytocin, not in the montane vole. And in the, um, for vasopressin receptors, what is seen is that in one very specific area, uh, again, part of the reward system, the lateral, uh, it's in the pallidum, we see a high density of receptors in the prairie vole and not in the montane vole. Now, that in and of itself is, as we know, that's only correlation, it's not causation. So they did all the manipulations to see if it really was significant. And I won't go through those manipulations now, but suffice it to say, it turns out uh, that it is highly significant. Now, it's not the only part of the story. There's certainly other things. One other thing that has to be there is the neurochemical dopamine. And that's because dopamine is used in memory and learning in order for neurons to change as a result of an input. So if a male and a female mate, but let's suppose that her dopamine receptors are blocked, then when she goes and finds some food, she thinks, wait, who was that guy? Right? You know, was it him? Was it him? She can't remember because her dopamine receptors were blocked. Now, I mention this only so that you know that this is, this is a very complex story. There's many other components to the story. But it does turn out that oxytocin plays a very special role. Um, so what does oxytocin do, anyhow? Now, there are economists who have called it the love molecule. That's a really dumb thing to say. It's not that at all. It does many things, even in the mammalian brain, besides what I just told you about. But one thing that does appear to be important is that there is kind of an opposition between stress hormones and oxytocin. So when oxytocin goes up, roughly speaking, stress hormones go down and vice versa. And when stress hormones go up and oxytocin goes down, then the animal tends to be anxious, vigilant, alert, ready for danger, um, and so forth. Now, that's not the whole of the story, but that is a significant, uh, a significant part of it. So the next question then, and this is really to try to take us into new territory about the nature of morality. How does how do we get from parenting to voles, mate attachment to the wider community? And the answer is probably the genetic changes that we saw in the case of the prairie voles. They appear to be quite small. The big genetic changes all came about over that long period as mammals emerged uh, on the planet. Those are the big genetic changes. And then small changes in the genes, for example, for the density of receptors of oxytocin in the nucleus accumbens, small changes will give you something like attachment to mates. And other small changes will give you attachment to kin and to friends. And once you have that, and once you have something that will allow you to make friends because your stress hormones go down, your feeling of it's okay, we can do things together, then you have the possibility uh, for attachment. So to our first approximation then, the approach here says that attachment and trust are the platform for moral values. They aren't the sum and substance of it. They are what makes it possible because caring is the essential part of that platform. So the next step, 
of Darwin's three, the social instincts, and then it was habits and skills, and finally problem solving. Uh, the next concerns norms. How do we learn social practices? Uh, what, what is the nature of social practices, and why are they, why do they have the character that they do? And I think increasingly anthropologists are recognizing that the social practices that a given group has are very often a reflection of a number of things, including local ecology, especially in a small group. In a large group, of course, the history of the group will make a big difference as well. And various kinds of accidents, whether there were earthquakes or volcanoes or floods or plagues, will also have a significant effect. And the other thing that, um, that I want to emphasize here is that the learning of norms, and this I think sort of kind of meshes in a way with Antonio Damasio's talk, but the learning of norms involves pleasure and pain, as we all know. So that when you receive approval for behaving in a certain way, you're apt to repeat that. And when you receive disapproval, you're apt not to. And the structures then that are involved in this uh, are the structures largely of the basal ganglia and how they connect to cortex. But if you didn't have basal ganglia, you're hosed. You're not going to acquire norms. There won't be any reward learning. There won't be any reinforcement learning, um, whatever. The other part I wanted to say here is that, um, and, and this, is, this really is um, an observation that is, is easily made in the context of, of very small groups, hunter-gatherer groups, but also small groups within a, a culture like our own. And that is many of the, the norms are learned implicitly. Children imitate, they just pick stuff up. And uh, they need not always be told exactly how to do something. You watch, you try, you might be corrected. Um, but uh, much of what we learn is implicit. And a place where that's really, really obvious it has to do with the social distance. So when we meet a new person, for example, if you stand too close or too far away in that meeting encounter, you know, little flags are raised. You know, why, why is she doing that? Certainly if you're too close, but that's relative to your culture. There are some cultures where you're expected to stand very close and others where you're expected to stand further away. The Inuit culture, as I discovered, has a very high threshold for helping. And that's because in their history, when you needed help moving your kayak or putting up your tent or whatever, it was kind of a sign that you were getting decrepit and not really going to be productive anymore, and maybe you should be thinking you know, about ice flows and you know, taking a hmm. And so consequently, they have a very high threshold because they do not want to insult me. So there I am, you know, struggling away. And I think, why aren't they helping me? And the answer is because it would be insulting to do so. And then I began to, you know, observe within our own culture what are implicit conventions are about helping. I think they're very complicated. They're often not articulable. They're implicit. But we often act on them. It's very cool. So the important structures are the reinforcement learning or the reward learning structures. They're subcortical, but they do interact with, in this very complicated way, which is not well understood uh, with um, the cortex. Now, uh, I don't have too much time left, so I just want to say a few quick things. Of course, once there is a social life, it doesn't mean within group competition uh, ceases to be. All of those who have his siblings uh, know that very well. And so many, many animal uh, species are seen to have various kinds of practices for limiting within group uh, violence and fighting. 
And um, that's certainly true. It's been known for a long time in the case of wolves, uh, but Franz de Waal has, has also seen it in chimpanzees. People, of course, have seen it in the field in chimpanzees as well. Now, you might think that you, you'd actually need a module or a gene for cooperation, but part of what this story suggests is that if animals are attached to each other, if they're part of a group, they like each other, they trust each other, then certain kinds of cooperative behaviors can quite naturally emerge. And um, wolves are a good case in point. So the wolves are a little bit scattered, they howl, they all come together, and they go off and uh, in single file following the, the alpha male. And in this particular picture, they have found a grizzly who has brought down an elk. And one-on-one uh, -on -one with the grizzly, it would be hopeless. But with the pack, they harass and they harass and they harass, and they will drive the grizz off, and then they will feed. And so it's a very good strategy, because it's easier than bringing down a caribou uh, on your own. But notice something else in here. Who is this guy? All right, so there's a raven. So then you ask yourself, well, how did the wolves know where to go? And the answer is because the raven, who, of course, can scout the territory very quickly, came to the wolves, alerted them, began to hop and fly off, and they followed the raven. So what's in it for the raven? Well, as the wolves are busy eating, the raven gets its mates. It squawks and calls and goes around, and pretty soon there's a lot of ravens. And what do they do? <laughs> well, they harass and harass and harass the wolves, and they drive off the wolves. And now they can get it. They could not have done that alone, uh, just the ravens. They could not have driven off the grizz, but they can drive off the wolves. So that's probably uh, a bit of uh, cooperation that they learned at some point, that they could bring the wolves, or the wolves would follow, and then they could get their fill. Um, but we do not almost certainly need uh, a genetic explanation uh, for that kind of behavior. Now, uh, Robin Dunbar has made the observation that uh, we can know more or less well only about 150 people. And interestingly, it's believed that hunter-gatherer groups did not really exceed that number. Uh, they might have been about that or smaller. And this sometimes is referred to as the Dunbar number, 150 people. But with the advent of agriculture and the growth of cities, uh, many people could not know everybody in the group. And so with that, I think we see the emergence of a variety of kinds of institutions, um, including sort of low-key institutions having to do with determination of what to do for, or for murderers and what to do about orphan children uh, and so forth. Um, but that's a part of a history that um, uh, many other people have talked about. All I want to say here is that this is the part of the story uh, where problem solving really um, emerges and comes into its own. Of course, it did so also in the hunter-gatherer situation, the hunter-forager-gatherer, um, but it really does here as well. And consequently, we, of course, have certain kinds of social problems that did not exist 5,000 years ago or that did not exist uh, even 300 years ago. Now, I want to end um, with this slide. Um, and I really like this slide, even though I agree that, you know, you, you can find all kinds of stuff on YouTube. But <laughs> what I like about it is this. So there is the orang. And he is in, in a rescue, a primate rescue center. And uh, one day, this old dog comes into the rescue center, and he's all alone. He kind of lopes along. And he and Rusty connected, and they have been fast friends ever since. 
Now, it's an interesting story because we tend to think of orangs as essentially solitary creatures, right? as not being social at all. And it seems not true. Um, and here I think the recognition of ecological conditions helps us understand the explanation for this. So orangs, unlike chimpanzees, are entirely vegetarian. They have to have a large territory in order to uh, pick leaves and eat them. And so in that respect, they're rather like black bears who need a large territory to forage in in order to manage. And consequently, they don't want other people in their territory or other animals in their territory uh, because then there's competition. And so they seem to be solitary. But given an opportunity, given sufficient resources, then we see that the sociality uh, emerges really quite naturally. And uh, so I think that it reminds us that there is, as it were, a lot of flexibility, a lot of, as I sometimes think of it, slop in a way in our social lives. And by that I mean that sometimes evolutionary biologists warn us that everything we do must directly or indirectly be conducive to our reproductive fitness. And I think there's a lot to that, up to a point. But I think that we also have a lot of slop, especially when we are living in times of plenty and prosperity. And that allows us, as it allows other animals, to be friend, to be with, to take advantage of the pleasures that come as a result uh, of sociality, of caring for, of helping, of cooperating, and just hanging out with uh, others. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. So I would like the panelists to come up for the last Q&A of the afternoon session. And while they are assembling and we get technology issues kind of worked out, I, I'd like to make a few remarks. Um, first, I'd like to remind you that we have the Nobel Banquet at 6.30. Um, and